Okay, I'll repeat everything I've said. Welcome to the webinar. People in Sydney, Australia, Tasmania, we've got Canberra, we've got Los Angeles, uh, that's Glenn. Um, what else? Where have we got you? Where are you? Aaron says yes, so that's good. Where else are you logging in from? Let's see, Melbourne. Hi, Annie. Karen in Tasmania, Victoria, Byron Bay. Yeah, Tasmania. Brisbane. So we're representing a fair few Australian states here. Colorado, US, Ray, welcome. So we've got a few people from the US. Uh, Mark in LA. Uh, we, Hobart, that's Paul. We usually also have some Italians. Have we got uh, any Italians on the call today? Italians and uh, people from Britain as well. No one from the UK? No one from uh, Italy today? Because we had about 133 registrations and we've got 63 people live now. All right, so uh, without further ado, because we've been um, struggling with this for about five minutes, I'm gonna just run through, through a few uh, things. Now, this was an issue at my end. Now, it can happen that there's something wrong at your end, okay? So if you're the only one who seems to have a problem, then maybe just reconnect or you know, disconnect. Reconnect should be a button at the bottom of your page, uh, of your screen. Um, I apologize, I sent a funny email yesterday that was referring to the productivity webinar, which we did two weeks ago. Um, sorry about that. Your email this morning should have had the, the right uh, uh, topic list for today. Um, there'll be Q&A time at the end. During presentation, it's going to be tough because I don't see the chat box. And it's just easier to get everything out. Um, it's going to be it's going to be full on. Uh, this is the most complete presentation I've ever done on, on synopsis. And synopsis is pretty important. Um, at the end, I'm going to make a few offers. Those people who missed the last presentation on uh, productivity will offer you the ebook and the replay of the webinar. And there's also a worksheet and a, and a checklist attached to that. And then the very first uh, webinar we did on adaptation, you can also purchase that ebook at the end of this session. Um, and that's all at a, at a lower price than you will normally find uh, on the, in the shop on, online. Good. I'm going to start sharing my screen and see how that goes. And then I'll walk you through that presentation. Um, um, all right. So first of all, the synopsis is, is an extremely important document because as some of you will have already found out, it can make the difference between getting your film financed or not, getting your film made or not. Um, getting your screenplay read, because mostly people will read the synopsis, first the logline, then the synopsis, before they read the screenplay. So it's uh, pretty important. Now, I've always hated writing it, or I used to hate writing it. Um, I regularly do reviews, assessments for the Australian Writers Guild, and they want us to write a synopsis of the screenplay that we've read. Now, when the story doesn't work, it is virtually impossible to write a proper synopsis within one page. By the way, an aside, synopsis, S-I-S uh, at the end, synopsis is plural, okay? So synopsis, S-E-S, -E that's uh, plural of synopsis. So for the writer's guild, I had to write those, and if the story doesn't work, it's just really, really difficult because there's no logic between the events. And that's why the synopsis is so, so powerful. You can, from that one pager, you can see whether a story uh, will not work. So you can eliminate. You know, if, a, if the synopsis works, it's a good indication that the, the screenplay might work. So it's really an eliminative document. Now, the, the, the synopsis is the son of the logline, or the daughter of the logline, if you wish, because first you write a logline. The logline tests the concept. Logline really only has main character, um, flaw, inciting incident, and the goal, so the, the, the gist of the story. But how that is executed in the, in the synopsis, we'll find out a little bit more about that. And ideally, you should, you should tell that synopsis as if it were a story in its own right, a full story. Um, what that means is that it's not just a summary of your, um, of your screenplay. It's really a story in its own right. 
if you can do that, you will have a better chance of entertaining the reader during the reading of the synopsis. And then obviously that will lead to reading the script with a, with a greater chance. So it is, it's a story in its own right. And if you were to tell that, that synopsis as a story, it would roughly take three minutes, which is the duration of a good short film. In other words, if you were to write a synopsis for a short film, it's going to be much easier than for a feature because in the short film, you will cover pretty much everything. Uh, 500 words, that's my ideal uh, word count. We'll get to that in a minute. In a screenplay, you've got about 20,000 words. So you have to do it in what, 1 40th. So that's 2.5% of the whole uh, word count of the script. Whereas if you have a, a three minute short film, that's three pages. So that should be roughly also about 500 words. So you're not going to be summarizing much. But if you do, you know, even TV episodes of, of 20 or, or um, 25 or 50 or an hour, uh, you're still going to struggle to get that all in those 500 words. Now I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you the techniques to deal with those limitations. So I am keeping an eye on the chat and Angeline, you say that your reception is patchy. Sorry about that. And um, I am recording it. Okay. So this will be made available as a replay. It will be for free. The replay will be free for everyone who's on the call today. People are, who miss it will have to pay a small amount. But everyone who's with us now, if you have trouble hearing um, or seeing, you can watch the replay for free. So back to the synopsis. It's a story. Try to tell it as a story. And maybe you should do, try that exercise. Try how it works to, to tell that story in three minutes, record it, write it down, and see how that is. <coughs> And another good aspect of, uh, of doing that exercise is you will train yourself in making logical connections between the events. That is, I find, the, the, the trickiest part of it, to make those uh, the abbreviated events still connect. And we'll get to that. As you write your synopsis, you may find out that your concept needs tweaking. Okay? You may have to go back to your logline, revisit your logline, or vice versa as you've, you've written your synopsis and you're writing your screenplay and you find that in the course of the writing of the screenplay, you're going in a new direction for one part of the story, then go back to your synopsis, rewrite it, keep those documents in sync. Now that's not just because I'm pedantic and I want you to have a perfect story pack, so to speak, story pack being logline synopsis, treatment and script, but you will see that once you come back from the screenplay to the synopsis, it's often really hard to make those changes in the shorter document. And you have to, you have to demonstrate that it still works within the 500 words, that, it's, that there's still a logic that you can communicate in three minutes. If your changes in the screenplay have a major effect on your summary and you can't summarize a story anymore, it's very likely that there still is a problem with the story. Now, if, you, if you're very experienced, obviously, you may be able to do that. And you know, if, you, if you have had a few films under your belt, you may get away with writing longer synopsis. But initially, keep those documents in sync. When you change something in your script, go back to the synopsis. Can you still summarize it? Can you, does it still make sense? That's a big one. The word count. Many of you uh, try to go over the 500 words. And it's all I know. You, you can always just get that one thing in that you want to uh, that you want to communicate if you do 600 words or or 650 or 550. Now try to stick to 500 uh, for a number of reasons. It, a page gets very cluttered if it becomes more than 500 words. It, it becomes longer to read, and people who have to read a lot will be inclined less to read your you know page and a half than 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 the page now obviously the 500 words is not an absolute if you go over a little bit that's fine but try to limit yourself try to to discipline yourself now, let's have a look what that would look like and um how you would ultimately execute it now this is this is uh, you can start with a three page all right a three page has about 1500 words if you keep to the 500 words a page and, and um, this is this is what what that would look like if you would uh, squeeze it all on one page. I've seen people try. I've seen people do it by you know, minimizing the font. So you, see, you start with a longer synopsis. It's much easier to first write your three pages or five pages, I don't care, 10, 
and then trim back. Okay, so three page would be 1,500 words. Then you go up to a two pager that is about uh, 1,000 words. And then ultimately you get to what you want, which is the one pager and the, the beautiful number of 500 words. And the 500 words, as I said, is, is about three minutes. What do you need to squeeze in that, uh, that word count? What are the things that you absolutely need to cover? I want to see the setting. The setting, you know, Sydney, present day. Then you tell the entire story, beginning to end. You tell that story chronologically in the present tense. All right, these are the basics. These are absolute basics. You, first, you open with the setting, then you tell the full story chronologically and with the present tense. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going through the three acts in, 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 a, in a summary. I'll tell you what needs to go in there. I'll give you a little bit more detail about Act 1, uh, a little bit less about Act 2 and 3. And, the, and the, the reason will become clear. So as I said, in Act 1, you open with the setting. Setting, you know, sometimes it's clear. You don't need to spend many words. That could be just, as I said, you know, Sydney, Australia, present day. If your setting is some fictional uh, location, it's uh, sci-fi, or it is an you know, alternate reality, uh, dystopian reality, then you, you need a few more words, and that's fine. And that's why that first act is going to be a little bit longer. So you may need longer than just a few words for the setting, but the setting needs to be clear, because it's going to be with tone and genre. Then comes the character. Could be fairly simple. My students know that I have a very simple approach to character. There's only three things we really need to know. That's the uh, physiognomy, the physicality, what they look like. There's the sociology, you know, how they fit in society, you know, where they stand, and the psychology, which is the most important one, because that's related to behavior and that's how we see the character act. That's critically important. They must all feature in the first few lines of your synopsis. Okay, so once you've focused on the setting, you go straight to character. How do you do that? You don't necessarily just describe the character, but you, you could describe an action that the character does and describe the character in the course of that action. But you, you need to do it in, in a minimal amount of time. And again, train yourself. Train yourself in brevity, concision. Learn how to set up a character very briefly, very, very uh, concisely. Once you've got a character, you're going to describe the current situation, the opening situation for that character. In Hero's Journey, it's the ordinary world. We need to understand that. Too often, and this is less an issue of synopsis, more an issue of story, too often that's going to be boring. They're going to, they're going to really make it ordinary. Now, ordinary means what is the normal world for the character. For the character to deserve to be in a movie, that needs to be interesting. Okay. Uh, Marty in Back to the Future is, is just a school kid, but he's got an interesting life. It's fun and there's stuff going on in his current situation. So describe where your character is at the beginning of the story, keep it interesting, and make sure that in the course of that description, in the course of the actions you describe, we get a good feel for that character. Now, part of that current situation is also the character flaw. So you're going to interweave that. So character and current situation, they're going to you know, interweave in that, in that ordinary world. And then that will all lead to the inciting incident. That's the, the, the collision course, I like to call it, because of the character flaw, which you mostly have. Mostly you'll have, uh, if you have a feature film, you'll have uh, transformational characters. Less the case in television, obviously, and, and in short films. But typically, you're, you will then have your inciting incident, and that is irrespective of your format. You, you need an inciting incident because the reader needs to understand that the story is starting. Where that fits in, in your synopsis, how much words you need to dedicate, I'm going to show you very, very precisely. And, and um, it'll be visual, it'll be very clear. Then you give your character's initial response to that inciting incident. That, that can be called the, uh, the refusal of the call or a flawed response, as Michael Arndt uh, calls it but it needs to be in, in your synopsis. How does your character respond to that first event, the major event that kicks off the story? And next, as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, really, you need to establish the goal. We need to know what this story is going to be about, what your character is going to try and achieve, 
And with that, we end Act 1. And we go into uh, Act 2. But let's look at the, the overview. So that's your, your first act, setting and character. It's about the, roughly the amount of space you will dedicate to it. They kind of interweave with the current situation, and then we lead to the inciting incident. We'll talk about sequences in a minute, and you'll see that this may conclude the first sequence. Then we go into the second sequence with the response of the character to that inciting incident, and then the goal is established. And that's the end of Act 1. Now we go into Act 2. Act 2, deliberately, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because it's so different. It's different for every story, and it's really you know, increasing complications, increasing tension, building to the midpoint, building to uh, sequence climaxes. It's important that I can distinguish in your synopsis your Act 2A. I need to, I need to understand how your story is built, and if, if you have structured your story as a transformational journey, then we need to see how the character behaves in that second act all the way to the midpoint. That needs to be clear in this synopsis. And you, you set that apart, even visually, even with, with paragraphs. Act 2A leads to the midpoint. I call it the midpoint reversal because in great stories, everything changes, everything flips. And after the midpoint, we have Act 2B. Together, they make up Act 2. And, you know, it's, it's funny how these proportions seem to be quite academic, but let me tell you this, I didn't start with these proportions. I actually started with a real synopsis that I wrote. I wrote a synopsis for a film and then looked visually how much space did it take, and this is the, this is the result. So this is an, an actual uh, film summarized. In a minute, we'll look at which one it is. You may have already figured it out from the, um, the, the word spaghetti you saw earlier on. And then we go into Act 3. Very simple. Act three is really building to the climax as quickly as possible that you may have at the beginning in a, a threshold journey. You know that I love those. Recently published an article about the threshold in Sicario, which I can highly recommend. Even if you don't like the film, study the threshold and see how the thresholds delineate the, the various story parts. So act three starts with the climax, ends with the aftermath, which is optional according to Robert McKee. He says that uh, European films don't have them. Well, these days you see them even in uh, European films. And that's Act 3, very simple. Most of it will take the climax and a little bit aftermath. So here's your overview. And um, in the background, you will see appear the synopsis I wrote for Nightcrawler. So this is all applied to Nightcrawler. And uh, when, as I wrote the synopsis, I realized how amazingly beautiful that story is told because it, it lends itself really easily to, uh, to a synopsis. Now, I, I only cheated once. Now, we'll get to that later on. I only cheated once, and it may need a few more words, but I'm sure that I can trim those words elsewhere. It's exactly 500 words, by the way. So this is what the synopsis would look like, Act, two, act 1, 2, 3, with those various uh, elements. We're going into structure a little bit more uh, later on, or rather, um, how you uh, lay it out. Theme, what do you do with theme in your synopsis? Well, ideally, I would say the theme needs to be clear by itself. You're not going to mention the theme. You're not going to say, this is a film about. Typically, we would understand what the theme is from the main character's behavior, from the character's flaw. I see Trish watch Sicario this morning. Well, great. Watch it again and again. Um, yeah, Paul wants to do the autobiography of the, of the, of the character. That's great because that's what that's what the what it's really about. Um, Clive about chronology. We'll get to that in a minute. So theme, I wouldn't state it um, explicitly because if you need to do that, then probably there's something wrong with your story, and you won't have the space. You simply don't have the word count available to mention the theme. Uh, another thing is that very rarely do films sell on theme. Films sell on character and story, not on theme. So you can easily leave that out, I find. All right, let's talk a few more minutes about structure, because, you know, I like structure. So, as we said, Act 1. And now you can read with me. Now, these, if, you, if, if it is legible, if you can read the words, this is not my final draft of this synopsis. We'll talk about the various versions in a minute. Um, act 2 is about twice as long as Act 1. Now, this is coincidence. 
And I'll, I'll explain. If, if we look at the proportion in this particular synopsis, it's almost perfect, 25%, 50%, and 25%. It's almost as if Michael Haig wrote this synopsis because it's, he, he is big in percentages. Um, I'm not. I think there should be a certain flexibility, fluidity, and you know, different stories require different proportions. Here, it, it just fell into place the way you see it here. Um, typically, your first act will look somewhat more like this. It'll be more like 33%, a third of your story, right? Because you need more time to set up. As I mentioned earlier, you, that, that setup of the character is so important. The setup of your setting may be important. And before you know, you're actually heading towards that midpoint of your synopsis, which is pretty scary, I know, but it's fine. You can, you can summarize that second act because if your concept is strong, people will get it. People will understand that you have material to show in that second act. But act one and act three are critically important, so you may have to dedicate proportionally more um, word count, more uh, page real estate to those acts. This is another approach, and this is um, the, the sequence approach. Again, entirely coincidentally, I did not deliberately pick uh, a, a Nightcrawler because it's so simple. I just picked the first one that, that came up and that I'd uh, watched fairly recently. When you read the book sequence, uh, sorry, screenwriting the sequence approach by uh, uh, Paul Golino, you'll learn that the most typical structure is the eight sequence structure. If you were to look at stories and, and break them down into sequences, mostly they will have eight sequences. Nightcrawler has nine, and it's because I've set apart the mid sequence. So again, this is not a, a class in, in story structure, and if I were to properly analyze Nightcrawler may change my mind. This is just about the synopsis. This is how you could do it. So in your synopsis, you could set apart these synopses. And, and that, again, makes the read easier because basically you are writing towards sequence climaxes, increasing climaxes. And if you follow the, the sequence structure, um, you'll typically have two sequences in your first act. First one ends on inciting instance, second act on, uh, ends on the, the goal established in the act one. Then you've got two sequences in act A1, and then here in this one, you've got a separate mid sequence, and then two sequences towards the end of act two. And then in act three, you've got a climax sequence and an aftermath sequence. Again, this is an average. And as you know, averages don't exist. Very often you've got nine, 10, 11, 12 sequence movies, and you've got movies with, with less sequences. Um, I think uh, uh, North by Northwest only had, no, I'm not going to say it. I was going to say three, but I'm wrong there. Anyway, what I want to show you, however, is what it would look like when I highlight the, the climaxes. These are the climaxes in Nightcrawler. So at the end of each sequence, there's a major event that bookends that sequence, and that makes it easy to write uh, the synopsis in this way. Um, don't look at the font. This is again just for a demonstration. A little later, I'll show you the actual synopsis as I've printed it. Layout and format, that's what I want to show you. Now, this is the, the, the block of text. And this is an example of a literal a printed synopsis 12 point font. I think it's Arial. You don't use Courier. You don't have to use Courier. In fact, Courier doesn't really read very well. It's not easy on the eye. So you would use something else. And do some research there because psychologically, some fonts read easier than others. If you're giving a printed synopsis, you may use a different font. Again, do your research because you'll use a different font for a printed synopsis than a synopsis that's read on the computer. Um, there's a whole whole science behind the, the use of fault. So do your research there. It's beyond the scope of this uh, webinar, but it's worth looking into. And, and I'm, I might even do it for the ebook. But I wanted to show you here is that if you subdivide your synopsis in four, you can have a 12-point font, which is which is nice and large. It's it's you know the natural, the typical font you would use. 
Um, it, it reads really easily, and you can still you know, ha have your four acts, so to speak, or you know, Act 2A and Act 2B. And you can have your title on the page. Look at that. So you get your title, you got a blank uh, line, and then the four acts. Now, here's another example, another uh, way of looking at it. Here, I have indented the sequences. By doing that, I'm using more uh, page real estate. As a result, I cannot fit the title on the page. So you, what you could do here is obviously make your font smaller. Some people have, have trouble reading anything smaller than 12 point. I don't mind anything down to 10, right? I often print a 10 uh, point, but 12 is ideal, 11 is, I would say, still acceptable. But this is what happens if, you, if you're going to indent your sequences. It means that you have to be even stricter on your 500 words. In this one, I create blank lines between, so, so line breaks between the acts. And immediately, visually on the, on the page, it shows me the structure of the film. And I'm, I'm a structure nut, and so are quite a few professionals definitely in Hollywood. So you can make their lives easy by structuring or laying out your synopsis this way. For this, I have to go, I had to go back to 11 point. I still have the title at the top, but then I have Act 1, Act 2A, including the, the midpoint, Act 2B, and Act 3. Maybe this is my favorite. I really like this one. So if, if, if I were to pick, I'd, I'd probably read this one before uh, all the others. Here's yet another opportunity, uh, the six stages. That's Michael Haig. So exactly the same I did before, only here, instead of acts, are the stages. What are they? First stage leading up to inciting incident, second stage leading up to end of act one, then the first half of act two, second half of act two, and then uh, climax, and then uh, resolution. Now here, I'm, I'm a little bit off with the third act, as you can see, because the, the break should be lower. The aftermath is shorter than the climax. So that was uh, about layout. Again, that will all be printed in the ebook. So you don't need to take notes now. But the ebook, e -book, however, I have to say, is, is at an additional cost. You can look at this replay as many times as you like. Names. What do you do with names? Well, again, a few practices. What I Most of what I give you during this webinar is my own experience. What I've seen, how I respond to it, what I find easy, and, and there's a few things that I've picked up uh, left and right. But I, again, I don't think there is an absolute rule. If you look up synopses, story synopses, or plot synopses on IMDb for films, you'll find synopses that are 10,000 words, 14,000 words. So basically, that's a treatment. That's almost the entire story. You have the you have synopses that de that detail the scenes in, in the film. Well, that's not what we understand the synopsis. You know, and and I should have mentioned that at the beginning. You can have a paragraph synopsis, you can have a page synopsis or two-page synopsis. I think those are the most common ones. How do we handle names? When you have a lot of characters in your film, obviously you're in trouble because you're gonna have a lot of names and your reader is gonna struggle telling them apart by the end of the synopsis. So you need to figure out how to deal with them. Uh, I would say the first recommendation is cut them out of the synopsis. Look at which characters you absolutely need to get the story across in 500 words. And you'll find that's quite a few supporting characters you, you need to cut out, some subplots you need to cut out. Then there's the issue of, are you going to use the name, the character name, or are you going to use the character function? Are you going to say Laura, or are you going to say Jim's mother? It depends. If Jim's mother is present in the first act and in the third act, and not so much in the second act, call her Jim's mother, because by the time we're in the third act, we forgot who Laura was. So keep that those considerations. People read a lot of synopses, and it's very difficult to remember who was who. What do you do with capitalization? Um, now, here's an example. In Nightcrawler, there's only about four that have survived my synopsis. There's Lou, there's Loder, there's Nina Romina, and there's Rick. Those are the four characters in this uh, in this uh, story. And those are the only four I mentioned by name in the synopsis. So what, what I was going to mention was capitals. In a screenplay, and now listen carefully, because some of you may not have heard this and not have picked up, because too often I see uh, people making mistakes against this. 
the first time we see a character appear on the screen, we capitalize the name to flag new character entering the story. This is not typically done in a synopsis. I say not typically. I've seen it done many times, and I don't mind. In fact, I like it. But that's just me, all right? Maybe it's good to remember who likes what, and then, you know, write a synopsis for that person. I like capitals for a new character. Other people don't. Um, someone even told me it, it is not done. So apparently it, it is frowned upon. I don't mind it the first time the characters appear in the script just as much as in the, in the synopsis. So all right, th there you have it. Don't do it except if you send me a synopsis. Flashbacks. So that's, uh, that's Clive's question, I think, about uh, chronology. Uh, Clive was asking, do you mean uh, chronologically in the sense of how the story will unfold on the screen or through uh, chronology? I would say that in some cases you, you may have to stick to true chronology. You may have to reconstruct the linear chronology of your film because if you're going to jump in 500 words, it may get confusing, all right? But sometimes it's essential. You, you can't possibly tell um, memento chronology, uh, chronological. You cannot possibly tell um, a pop fiction chronologically because it, 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 it's, it's the essence of the film. You cannot tell um, Michael Clayton chronologically. See, so you, th that's a call you need to make as a rule I like to see the story chronologically because people will always reconstruct it. Even if you tell a story in flashbacks, people will reconstruct and will ask, will see, does it work? Where does this flashback sit? Does it does that work? Does that make sense? Would this character do this? And so forth. So it's it's a call you make. As a rule, you stick as closely to what viewers see on the screen, but you'll find that within 500 words it's going to be extremely complicated. Because each time you introduce a flashback, you know, on the screen visually it's easy, on the page it's very different. So what you could do is, if they're flashbacks because a character hallucinates or a character dreams, you could summarize that and say the character you know, repeatedly has the same dream or the character repeatedly hallucinates. You know, that's, that's probably a, a second best solution. But as I said, the, the, the main rule is still you try and stick to the experience of the story, of the actual story. And if that includes flashbacks, and you can fit it into 500 words and go for your life. Writing style, super important because it's the, it's the lubricant. It, it can really help stories that may not be absolutely massive blockbusters. It may help the reader getting interested. So your writing style better be damn interesting, you know, damn entertaining, and um, you know, uh, really uh, rubbing us in. And you you keep in mind the three C's. Three C's in my books are clarity for first and foremost, concision, and color. Clarity is the most important one. If we don't understand what your story is about, forget it. We're not going to be interested. Interested. Concision, brevity, economy is definitely the second most important quality because that's how you tell stories for the screen. You boil down your story to the absolute minimum. You need to be able to do that in a, in a synopsis. Thirdly, color. So once you, you are clear and you have trimmed it to the absolute basics, now try and make it interesting. And but in, in fact, if you, if you do this one and two, properly often you will have colorful words words you know avoid to be to have to see to walk but use specific words the way you would do in a screenplay so that's the three c's that's your writing style no room for error it's only 500 words so there should be zero typos absolutely no mistakes you must read and reread and proofread and have someone else read it if you have mistakes in 500 words, you extrapolate that to a screenplay of 20,000 words, um, it's just not acceptable. So make sure that it, it's, it's, it grips us and there's nothing distracting us in the synopsis. A word about causation. You know, um, Ian, we'll, we'll get to questions in a minute. 
But what about causation? Everyone is familiar with cause and effect in the, the physical sense, in the sense of physics. Something happens and as a result, the next thing happens. In court, um, we talk about causation. Someone does something and then as, as a result, another character does that. So causation and culpability are very close. In a story, we need causation. We need to see that what a character does has impact on other characters. We need to see that actions by a character are motivated by actions of another character. That's just how stories work. So causation is a really, really important concept. Now, causation is the most important, uh, sorry, the, the, the most difficult concept when you're writing your synopsis, because as you start trimming, you're actually cutting the links between the cause and the effect. And once you, you finish your synopsis, those links need to be restored. There needs to be a, a, a flow, a logical flow, an emotionally logical flow between what's written in that synopsis. And the more you cut, the greater the danger that you are cutting the causal links or the causational links between characters' actions. To fix this, there's a great exercise. You try to rewrite your synopsis in terms of an action and then you use the words, therefore, so-and-so does this. As a result, so-and-so does this. Or because this happens, this character does this. And you, you use those words rather than uh, then or and, which is neutral, which doesn't indicate any causation. So make sure your story is cohesive. It makes sense. And Nightcrawler is a, a wonderful example because it, it has that flow. You could write the synopsis like that. In fact, the whole screenplay is almost written like one as one sentence. So you, it is the, the, it has that cohesion in the screenplay, and you can recreate that cohesion fairly simply in the synopsis. When you have a strong story, it'll be easier to write that synopsis and and um, respect that cohesion and that causation rather. Um, so that, that's it. That's it. We're, that's that's really the most important uh, aspects of writing uh, synopsis. So I, I wish I had my summary here, but I don't. So we'll just have to improvise it. Um, I've spoken about what needs to go into the synopsis. I've spoken about the content. I've spoken about why it is important. I've spoken about the, the structure, how you lay it out, about the, the, the design, the layout, the format. I've spoken a bit about uh, the style, the writing style. And um, as I said, all that I'll, I'll put together in the ebook, and I, sh I should in a minute. And I don't have I don't have that for you guys yet. I'll email you when it's ready. But I've, I've got uh, that last time. But it's time for questions. So let's have a look at what we've got here in terms of questions. Um, so I've already answered Clive's question. The the next one here I can see is Ian. Ian asks if Memento uh, what, what to do with uh, films like Memento and uh, Irreversible. The, the more stories diverge from the mainstream, the harder it's going to be to summarize it. And when you have Memento and, and Irreversible, it's, it's virtually impossible. So you will need more time. You will need more, you need to, you need to get interest from your reader another way, because I don't believe you can um, uh, convincingly summarize it. You may have to do a lot of cheating. So you need to, to cheat by basically summarize whole sections and and describe in, in one sentence what happens in a whole sequence and then also describe the way in which it is presented. So you need to you need to clarify the mentor, you need to clarify that this is the condition of the character, and this is how the character experiences the world, but we know differently. So you, you're going to share with the reader what the viewer knows, not just what the character knows. Ian asks what my attitude is on adjectives. I don't have a strong opinion about adjectives, only I see the, the moment I become aware of them, they're not essential. So um, in, in a synopsis, you'll obviously write less adjectives than you will in a novel. It, ultimately, it all comes down to do you feel that you are adequately summarizing your story in 500 words? All right, it, it'll, the longer you work on it, the 
more natural it will seem what needs to go. Now that, that sounds like a cop out, but as you get more experience, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, we'll need adjectives. Obviously, we, we, you know, we don't need to know the color of the car, but we need to know the, the, the emotion of the character, the tone uh, at the key moments in the story. And then for that, you may need adjectives. Now, um, adverbs are often a bigger issue because they're so long. Clive, is there a different approach to writing a synopsis as part of developing a screenplay as opposed to writing a synopsis for a script you've already written? Great, 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 great question. Um, yes, there's a big difference. First of all, when you're writing, uh, once you've written a screenplay, it may have to be more selling. It, it, you're you're going to give this to people who may not have the same understanding of story that those who read it in the development stage will have. All right. So after uh, finishing the the script, and even when, when the film is finished, an, an entirely different type of synopsis will be written. Um, but th I don't think this is an answer to your question. When you're developing, you're really writing the synopsis for yourself. Remember what I said in the beginning of our session? I said that you need to keep your documents in sync to make sure that there is that causational link, there's the flow of it. It, it. it all makes sense when you go back to the synopsis. So you do a lot of rewrites there. I hope that that answers your question. So, and if it doesn't, then uh, feel free to, um, to put, it, put another one in there. Tom asks, where can we read the synopsis of produced films? Well, the problem is that if you go to IMDb, you have the, the, the tagline versions that are like half a, you know, it's just a, just a paragraph, and then you have the 10,000 word versions. You don't really get the, the one pages. Um, I was a journalist, for, for a film critic for a long time, and the film companies, the distributors would provide um, a publicity pack, and that would often include a synopsis. And, and if the company had done their work, it would often include a one page synopsis and a long synopsis, a two or three page synopsis. I'll put an example of that in the ebook. I've got one for the wonderful movie, Be Kind, Rewind. Um, so you can see what they look like when they come from the production company. Um, Mark asks, how do you know if you've created a solid, great synopsis? Is it okay to go back and write a brand new one, either if you feel your script deviated from what you originally wanted to write or to redo a new synopsis? And therefore, we write create a better new script. Well, that's the whole that's that's the whole development uh, game. That's the, that's the spiel. You write your synopsis. You write your script. It may change. You go back to your script. Go back to your synopsis, and so forth. So, yeah, you know, obviously, it is it is fine. It is it's okay. And even if you've already sent that synopsis to someone, don't worry. Ultimately, you are serving the story. You're not serving people. <coughs> Um, and you include how the story ends. Yes, I, I, I hope I was clear about that. Don't end with an air of mystery. No, you don't end with an air of mystery if you are trying to get your uh, script sold because the people you're selling to have no time to read the whole script if they don't know that the story is going to work, that the end is going to work. So yes, do include the ending. Um, it's different if the distribution company is going to use a synopsis to sell the film or to advertise the film. Then you'll have half-page synopsis. You know, if you back of a DVD, that's often a half-page synopsis, something like that. Craig asks about thresholds. Can you please elaborate what that is? I'm going to do a whole webinar about thresholds. I've decided it'll be later in the year, probably second half of the year, but it's a big topic. Um, in short, a threshold is a term from Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's when the hero goes into a new stage, goes into a new world. The biggest thresholds are going from Act 1 into Act 2, going from the ordinary world into the special world. But essentially, every sequence may have a threshold. Every scene can have a, th a threshold of a different magnitude. And in, in our films, in our stories, we... Um, we make those visible, we make them visual, but they are essentially psychological thresholds. So basically the, the character moves geographically at the same time when the character moves on psychologically. That's really the, the basic of it. But I'd, I'd love to do a whole webinar on that. 
Victoria says in TV writing, should we write a synopsis for the whole series and then another one for the episodes? Great question. Um, I'd say yes. I'm not uh, an expert in television and maybe I should play it back to you guys. There may be some people on the call here who have more experience in that. Um, you would definitely write an episode, episode synopsis because the episode really needs to convey or the synopsis for the episode needs to convey the structure. Uh, can you do a synopsis for the whole series? Probably not, because when you're when you're selling the series, when you're writing your um, uh, your Bible, you don't have an ending. Okay, so you could write a synopsis for a season. So yes, you could do a synopsis for a, for a TV series season, but it's hard to do for a, for a whole series. Um, there, the character descriptions are more important because of, of ultimately the stories will come from the characters. Clive says, if you think your show has a surprise ending, then surprise us in the synopsis. Absolutely. If you have a strong twist, then give us the twist, convince us that it's going to work. Um, because, you know, no one is going to spend their money to see whether, whether it works. Um, Gita asks, your synopsis just has the A storyline, not the B storyline. That depends. If you have a, a story that's very straightforward, a single point of view, you may be able to include um, a B storyline. If your character has, a, your story is a lot of characters and a lot of subplots, you may have to cut some out. It really depends on the top story. It depends on how much time, how much space you need for your setup. If your, your first act setup eats up a third or half of your synopsis, you will definitely have to cut any, any subplots. Uh, Clive says synopses on IMDb are often written by fans. They're not useful for our purposes. It's absolutely correct. And in that respect, it'd be a good exercise to look at um, the long synopsis for Nightcrawler on IMDb, which I have used as a basis, but I've, I've rewritten it. And you'll see that how I've changed the style, have cut out uh, what I've cut out, and I've brought it back to a, a very minimal uh, 500 words. Um, I think that's it. Um, yeah, have, do we have more questions? We're going towards the end of the hour, so it's almost time to wrap up. I'd like to answer one more question. In the meantime, what I'll do is I'll make that um, um, I'll make that ebook available of last uh, webinar. I did a webinar two weeks ago about productivity. And thank you for your emails. That was really amazing. Uh, I'd like to know when the, whether there's anyone on the call today who was on the webinar and has tried any of the tips that I gave. So um, anyone? Did anyone venture into the productivity routine, the discipline? In the meantime, I'll give you that offer for the webinar replay as well as the ebook and the um, checklist and worksheet. So who was there? Uh, Glenn, you were on the productivity webinar. Did you take anything out of that? Uh, Karina, okay, I've got a question from Karina here. What specifically do you mean about character psychology? Can you give an example um, of this describing synopsis? Yeah, it, it, the example will be in the, um, the Nightcrawler synopsis, but let me see if I can bring it up on the screen here. Um, okay, need to, this is improvising. Uh, Nightcrawler, one page synopsis. Yeah, this is an older version, but I will, I will look at this one. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, where is it? This should be it. There we go. Not this. This one again. This one. Um, let me see. Yeah, you should be able to see this. Um, if I can make it bigger. No, it didn't work. So. The opening of this one is Los Angeles present day. Louis Bloom struggles to make a living. He can't get a job, so he steals in pawns, cuts fences, and sells them as scrap. He's brazen and smart, but things haven't quite worked out for him yet. 
So the, these three lines kind of combine his character setup and his um, uh, sociology and psychology, right? So he's at the bottom end, bottom ladder uh, uh, of society, he, but he's brazen and smart. That's his psychology, okay? We don't, I haven't described his physiognomy, which is what needs to be added to it. So he's mid-20s. That's one thing for sure that, that needs to be added here. So age is one of the critical aspects. I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, good. So we've got a few people here who were on the webinar. Glenn started his uh, mornings in a similar manner to how are you? Okay, so you're starting. Good. Makes a big difference. Great. Very happy to hear that. Now, I'd like to hear, obviously, what sort of dis difference it makes. Glenn, if you could elaborate uh, maybe now or in an email, I'd love to hear how um, that productivity discipline is helping your writing because that was the whole idea. Um, Ian, if we've already paid for the ebook of this seminar, I assume it will be in the mail. Absolutely, yeah. The ebook doesn't exist yet. I'm going to incorporate uh, your questions as much as possible in the webinar. Um, can you increase the size, please? Trish, are you? <laughs> you meant the size of the the text. Sorry. Good. Um, uh, Beatrice, you need to send me an email so I can sh make sure you get that um, ebook. Gita says, last webinar offer says $19 when I uh, click the link. Uh, yeah, it's 26. That's because you're in Australia and we are totally stuffed with the exchange rate. The $19 is US, so it's, it's, so it's clear for everyone. Yeah, it's the US. It was $9, it's gone up to 19 If you're there, the, during the webinar, um, you have the $9 offer. So I'm not offering you guys the uh, this webinar yet but I'll email you with a $9 offer. And it's also the uh, only time ever it'll be at this price. So it will only increase. Um, by the way, if you would be interested in the um, adaptation uh, ebook that is still available, um, I'll put a link in the email. I was going to put it here, but that's just going to take us a little bit too far. We're going very closely to the hour. I'd like to wrap up uh, on the hour if we can. Good. All right. So we have had a steady 62 people on the call today. That is great. Thank you guys for joining in. Um, as I said, I'm going to email you with the link to the replay, which you get for free forever, and the ebook, which will be at $9 for you guys. It'll be 19 later and even uh, to 39 uh, after that. So this is your final opportunity to get that at the, the ridiculous price of $9. And this is how I can do these webinars, obviously. I you know, there must be some some back end because a lot of work goes into the preparing of the of the ebooks and they will be revised as well so give me your feedback i'd like to hear your feedback on the webinar as well i'm sorry about the issues with sound at the beginning i'll try and figure out uh, what the issue was there looking forward to the next uh, next webinar <coughs> sorry about that the next webinar will be in two weeks time um it'll be more a general type of webinar like productivity next uh, session will be about building your website as a creative. That's a question I've had from a lot of people because I've built a lot of websites myself and many writers want to know how you do that without spending thousands of dollars. So the idea is to, to build a, web, a website during the webinar. I'm actually going to do everything with you guys. I'm going to register the domain name and I know it's, it's risky, it's asking for, for trouble, um, but I'm sure it will work. We'll register the domain name, we'll set up hosting, we'll choose a, a template, and we'll actually get a website online during the webinar in two weeks' time. So that's the idea. And then in four weeks' time, we'll have a screenwriting uh, webinar again. And, and I, I need to check what the topic is going to be. I'll email you what that may be. The thresholds will be one. I think it's writing active characters. I think that's the one. I think we'll be talking about writing active characters in four weeks' time building website in two weeks time. All right, thank you all. Great to have you. Have a wonderful weekend. And obviously I'm hoping to see you all again in um, two weeks time. Bye. It's been amazing. I just am so confident now to, to sit down and write. I've had a go at writing my outline and it, it's 
working really well rather than just floundering like I was last time. So it's having some great direction and really good, clear teachings that I've been able to draw on to do this course. I highly recommend Carmel for all the things that can be obvious, but when he explains them, they're not so obvious and they're powerful and essential for you, an excellent screenwriter. One of the amazing things about Corral, he fundamentally shared everything that I needed to know to actually make um, a script. So, and put everything from my head into my writing and make it something substantial. So, um, happy, <laughs> elated, more like it. I mean, I know what I'm doing now. Corral takes a wide range of uh, theories and practices and combines it with his own experience on both sides of the film market. And it's invaluable as a, as a writer, particularly someone like myself, moving from TV and one-liners into more dramatic territory. It's been an amazing kickstart for how to get a feature film made. There are quite a few things that the story series gave me which I didn't even realise I needed or wanted. And it was like a whole load of light bulbs going on. But other things too, like how to write a log line, how to pitch, point of view, it's just been valuable, absolutely valuable. I had a tip from a friend who'd actually successfully completed six screenplays, which is pretty amazing. And he's done um, Carol's course twice, the story series. And I thought this is a great recommendation, so if I want to write a screenplay, I should do the story series. And I did.